Okay. So we've learned that Faraday's law is valid for two different situations. There's this one situation where we have an EMF induced by magnetic forces on charges when a conductor moves through a magnetic field. So we have this conductor. Sorry, there's a lot of text there, but there's a lot of little points that I need to make sure I don't forget to mention. So I got to put everything on there, lay it all out. Okay, we got a conductor moving through a, a field, okay? And that produces a induction situation. In the other situation, we've got a time varying magnetic field that induces an electric field and hence an EMF. The E field is induced even when no conductor is present. This E field differs from an electrostatic field in an important way. It's non-conservative, so the line integral of E dl around a closed path is not zero. That's a kind of a little uh, technical point about vector fields and stuff, which I'll sort of discuss here. So what does it mean when the line integral around, for a conservative field, what does it mean when a line integral around a closed path is zero? This is what it means. So if I have some sort of line integral, and remember, we talked about the line integral being the value of the function along this path here. And I have some sort of conservative field. Then for the conservative field, the parts, there's going to be parts going this way, but there's also going to be parts going this way. The line integral, the value of the field along this closed path. And these paths are all going to cancel out because one's going this way and one's going this way. So all these little differential bits for a conservative vector field, they're going to sum up to be zero. But that's not the case for a non-conservative vector field. So why is it that this electric field that's induced is not like a static electric field from a charge? Because a, a conservative vector field includes things like a collection of charges. That's going to produce a conservative vector field. Here we have non-conservative. So why is that? Um, well, first of all, when a charge moves around a closed path, the field does non-zero amount of work on it. So remember, we talked about magnetic fields doing no work. But here, we see that the field does do work on it. And it follows that for such a field, the concept of potential has no meaning. So this idea of an electric or magnetic potential, potential energy, that's a that's an important concept. We use that so much in physics. Incredibly, that doesn't have any meaning in this scenario for an induced field. So that's pretty weird because everything that we've learned in physics up to now, everything, all the forces that we can describe, they've always been in terms of like the gradient of a potential. For example, your gravitational field, you, you've got your acceleration component of your gravitational field, ma equals f. Let's say it's force due to the gravitational field, right? It's like m, m, big G over r squared, and there's like a minus sign there. Well, the force is the, the potential associated with this is the integral minus the integral of this. So we have that force can also be, for a conservative field, it can also be expressed, expressed as minus the gradient of the potential. So if I take the derivative of the potential associated with my gravitational field, then I get the force associated with it as well. So you can see that it's, it's something like it goes like m, m, g over r. And you also can have the same analogous concept for electric potential. You have this 1 over r for an electric potential, and then it's one minus 1 over r squared for the force associated with that. Now, I'm going to erase that because that doesn't apply to what we're talking about today. But I just wanted to illustrate what we're talking about when I say that 
it can't be expressed in terms of a potential and how that relates to what we did before. Because you've seen gravitational potential. You know that there's gravitational potential energy. So there's still energy in this field, but it's not electrostatic. It's not an electrostatic field. It's not a normal energy that can be phrased in terms of a potential. So it follows that the, such a field, for such a field, the concept of potential has no meaning. We call such a field a non-electrostatic field. In contrast, an electrostatic field is always conservative, and that was talked about last uh, quarter for you. Um, and it has an associated potential function, which I just talked about for the case of the gravitational potential. Okay. Um, despite this difference, the fundamental effect of any electric field is to exert a force F equals QE on a charge Q. This relationship is still valid whether E is conservative and produced by charges or non-conservative and produced by a changing magnetic flux. Okay, finally, what's the one thing I can think of just intuitively that could sort of lead a hint as to why this field is non-conservative whereas my uh, field, my QE associated with, say, a collection of charges is conservative. Let's think about permanence here. When I take a charge, okay, when I have an electric charge, that charge has some intrinsic property in nature due to it. It has, let's say an electron. An electron has an intrinsic spin, a quantum number that's associated with its angular momentum. It's quantized too and it has a certain quantum unit of charge. Every electron has the same amount of charge. And when nature creates my electron, and it creates this, this little fundamental particle, an electron or a proton, proton has the positive charge. Either way, when this thing is created, it's created in a form of mass energy. It has a mass associated with it as well. Every electron and every proton has the same amount of mass. And it's created and it's there, there's a permanence to it. In contrast to this, this field is produced by a change in flux. So there's a change in flux. There isn't sort of like this permanent mass energy created with a particle. And that's sort of one way you can see how there's a fundamental difference between the, uh, this field, this, electrostat this electric field versus the classic electrostatic field associated with charges. It's not created by a fundamental particle, it's created by a change in flux. But it's fascinating that for a moment, you can actually get the same effect from a change in a field as you can from a fundamental particle. You can get the same, we can get the same units, the same force, it's just the origin of it is completely different. It's not exactly the same because it's non-conservative, but other than that, it is. Anyway, that's sort of an interesting thing to think about. So a changing magnetic field acts as a source of electric field of a sort that we cannot produce with any static charge distribution because there's the fundamental difference of how it, of how it originates. They don't originate in the same way. What's more, you can see that a changing electric field acts as a source of magnetic field too. So the electric field can change and produce a magnetic field. So there's a symmetry between the two fields in electromagnetic waves, a symmetry that one of the most famous physicists of all time, Maxwell, discovered and used to great effect. And we'll talk about that more coming up. So um, you can consider a few practical applications. We have guitars. Electric guitars have pickups that uh, use currents induced in coils by the vibration of ferromagnetic strings. So the strings, the strings are magnetic. This is how an electric guitar works. The strings are magnetic. The pickups, those little metal things in the neck of the guitar, not the neck, sorry, the little metal things that are below the neck. So you have like the guitar here, and then you have the body of it. And then down here, you might have like, some pickups, these are gonna, the string is gonna go down like this. There's like six of them in a guitar. And then when those strings vibrate, it produces a 
signal that the coils can pick up. It's a change in a magnetic field, which is a flux. And what happens is that change in flux from the, from the strings vibrating, the, the pickups, the electric signal is so sensitive to that change that it actually produces an electric signal and the electric signal is amplified through an amplifier and then our ears can discern that difference. So depending upon how you strum the guitar, whether you play it really loud or you play different like style of strumming or different notes, all of those things are actually detected as field information. And now you can see how it happens. The pickups work through electromagnetic induction because the change in the magnetic field from the strings produces an electric field, which can then go through to the signal and be amplified through the electric apparatus of the amp. It doesn't work, a, it does still produce a flux when it's not plugged in, but you don't hear the flux because it's not amplified. The signal's too small. There's nothing to amplify it into a significant sound wave through the speaker. The operation is, is pretty complicated, but it makes sense when you see electromagnetic induction. The alternator, which we talked about in the last class, in most cars, uses a rotating magnet to induce currents in stationary coils. And whether we realize it or not, magnetically induced electric fields play this important role. So here's some applications. Uh, we have a car that's powered by an electric motor. As the car comes to a halt, the spinning wheels run the motor backwards so it acts as a generator. This is kind of like um, Priuses work like this. So like if you have a hybrid, it also works like this. The hybrid gets started up and it gets its initial momentum from a gasoline engine, but then it uses these, the, this motion of the spinning wheels to use as a magnet. And the spinning wheels produce an alternate, a changing magnetic field. So when you, if you're drive, driving a Prius or some kind of hybrid, when the car comes to a stop, you can actually, it produces, the wheels are still spinning and that change produces a change in the magnetic field which produces a current. And the current goes through to the lithium battery in the back seat of the car. There's another, there's a secondary battery um, that's like, you know, not the, not the main battery that you talk of, that you normally think about with the car battery. It has one of those two, but it also has the lithium battery. And that signal, that electric current gets generated and goes through and actually charges the battery. Okay, so then we also have the rotating crankshaft of a piston engine airplane, and it spins a magnet, which induces an EMF and an adjacent coil and generates the spark that ignites fuel in the engine cylinders. And this keeps the engine running, even if the airplane's other electrical systems fail. So we have a, you've ever heard of a backup generator in hospitals? Same concept here. Same concept as a backup generator. Even if we lose power, we have a source of, sig of electrical current in the case that we have a power failure so that we don't lose everything. They're gonna put something like that in a helicopter as well because you, otherwise you have to worry about a crash happening. Okay, let's do an example. Suppose we have a solenoid that has 500 turns per meter and a cross-sectional area of four centimeters squared. The current in its windings is increasing at 100 amperes per second. So we've got an increase in current. Find the magnitude of the induced EMF in the wire loop outside the solenoid. Find the magnitude of the induced electric field within the loop if its radius is two centimeters. All right, pull out a sheet of paper and try to work that one, and then I'm gonna work it out on the board. So this is an interesting situation. Now we've got a solenoid and it's got 500 turns and it's doing some sort of thing because we've got an increasing current, but it's not a magnetic field now. It's not a changing field, it's a changing current. And it's saying, what's the induced EMF in the wire loop outside the solenoid from this change in current? Okay. So let me draw like a little bit of a picture of this here so we can see this better. So you've got this cylinder here going out into space like this. And then we've got these windings. So let's draw this in uh, purple here. So we've got coming around like this. Okay, 
There's the windings of the solenoid. And then we've got a galvometer, which is gonna be our detector for the current. We use a galvometer for that. So we'll draw that out here. Get on a sheet of paper and try to follow along with this. It's really helpful to draw pictures of this while you're thinking about what's going on. Okay, sorry that's a little bit, kind of a lot going on here, but try to erase this. So this is my galvometer in pink. The coil of the solenoid is in purple. I've got some changing B field because I've got some current. So the blue, it says here, the blue cylinder shows the region where there's a magnetic field. So everywhere inside this solenoid, what this cylinder represents is actually the existence of a B field within this. And if you remember from your exam that you had, I had a question on there about a solenoid and the magnetic field is essentially zero outside of a solenoid. So the B field is all inside here, B field like that. And then, um, and it's going this way, okay? And so we've got this interesting result here. Um, now let's see what we've got current, but oh yeah, I didn't quite complete this, did I? I gotta, I gotta also describe where's the current coming from. I is coming from this direction and it's got a changing current, di by dt. I shouldn't put a vector over there, it's not a vector. Okay, so we've got, we've got a current and we've got a change in current with respect to time. We've got our current and it's going around this uh, and it's actually going to induce a current in the galvometer. So there's going to be a current here too, an I prime. There's a current induced in the wire of the galvometer, and there has to be, or else the galvometer wouldn't detect anything, because the galvometer is not connected to the wire loop of the solenoid, is it? No. So if it was, if there was no wire loop there, the galvometer wouldn't detect anything, but there is. Okay, so the increasing magnetic field inside the solenoid causes a change in the magnetic flux through the wire loop and hence induces an electric field E around the loop. Why is there a change in the magnetic flux through the wire loop? Why is there a change? Real quick, somebody, anybody, raise a hand. Why is there a change in the magnetic flux? Yes. Yes, perfect. Change in current. The current is changing, and we know that the current generates a magnetic field by the right-hand rule. So a change in current should, gener should generate a change in magnetic field. Sometimes physics is not at all intuitive, but this one perfectly is, perfectly intuitive. Great. So we have a change in B field. Okay, so this is going to induce an electric field now around the loop, and then we're trying to find the induced EMF and the electric field magnitude. So we can use equation 29.8 to determine the EMF. The loop and the solenoid share the same central axis. So by symmetry, the electric field is gonna be tangent to the loop and has the same magnitude E all the way around its circumference. So we can use 29.9 to find the electric field. And if, you're, if that last part, you're kind of scratching your head a little bit, that's okay. This is not super simple. That's why a lot of people skip this over because it's, there's a lot of geometry going on here, but it's very fascinating, it's very important. So we use our equation to find the induced EMF. And we have our formula for the B field that's where, of the solenoid. That's where that formula comes from. So we've got our B field of a solenoid right? We remember that from the exam. We could use that on our exam to give our, the B field of the solenoid. And now we have a change in current. So we've got this, this change in EMF minus dB by dt. And that's going to be equal to minus, this is just the, this is associated with the magnetic field of the solenoid, number of turns times the area. And then we have our current, di by dt. 
So you can see there that the current term is what takes on the time dependence there. So we plug in those values and we've got like our permeability of free space, minus four pi times 10 to the minus seven Weber's per ampere times meters. So minus four pi times 10 to the minus seven. Uh, we'll do units, Weber's per ampere. It's nice to have our units written out there. And then we've got 500 terms, okay? Per meter, so we're gonna do turns per meter. There's still a little bit of a unit there. Four times 10 to the minus four for the area. This is the area that's coming in here. Four times 10 to the minus four. And that's gonna be meters squared. Perfect, units of area. Finally, we've got our current, which is 100, change in current, which is 100 amperes per second. It's a change in current. So it's almost like an acceleration, almost. We won't say it's an acceleration, but it, you could, it's kind of like an acceleration. Okay, that gives minus 25 times 10 to the minus six Weber's per second, which has units of volts. Minus 25 times 10 to the minus six of volts. Sorry, I ran out of space here on the board but you get the idea. We've got a voltage here and 25 microvolts, minus 25. By symmetry, the line integral of E dot DL has an absolute value two pi R E, no matter which direction we integrate around the loop. This is equal to the absolute value of the EMF. So here we have that the electric field is equal to the average value, or the absolute value, sorry, not average, absolute value of the EMF. So we have our EMF. Now we say the absolute value of this is all that matters. That divided by the line integral of two pi r, um, which is around the loop. So we have, what is the, what am I talking about when I say two pi r? I'm talking about a section of the loop. Two pi r is this, this r. So I have a radius here, an r of this loop, the area of this loop. So there's a change in flux around this loop. The solenoid has a changing magnetic field. The solenoid is going through the loop with the galvometer. The change in flux associated with this change in current and changing magnetic field drives an EMF and it's going, you can see the current is driven this way. So the EMF is going this way as well. We have a B field and there's also going to be a B field to oppose this current, to oppose this, or I mean, not to oppose the current, to oppose this change in flux. And we know, we know which way the B field is going because we know that we have an increasing B field. So we know that the B field has to be opposing that increase, going the opposite sense from this loop. And then here, what we're talking about is, we're saying that we can actually find the electric field. The electric field, which is not the same thing as the EMF. The electric field is the same thing, not the same thing, but similar, the same idea as the electric field associated with charges or a battery or something like that. The electric field, E, associated with this change in flux is the absolute value of the EMF that we found from this step divided by the total line integral of two pi r. So the total value of the field all the way that lies along this line, we can do a line integral there and that's our electric field. And when we do that, we look at the value of the EMF, the absolute value is 25 times 10 to the minus six. We don't care about sine anymore. We're just looking at absolute value. And then our total line integral around this whole loop is two pi r. So the total value of this, yes. Okay, so we have that a changing magnetic flux 
through a closed loop produces an induced electric field, the line integral of E around the loop is equal to the induced EMF in the loop. So if we know the induced EMF and we know the line integral, then we know the electric field. So we have to go, so finding this electric field is not a simple matter. I mean, it kind of is because we could look at the reading on the galvometer actually, and we could infer an electric field based off of that too. But if you wanna be technical about it, the technical way to find it without using just like a measuring device analytically through math is by this formula. We have, we know what the EMF is, and then it's gonna be the line integral of E uh, around the loop is equal to the induced EMF. So we can find E per unit length. It's essentially what we're doing here. See, and you can see that. The electric field, it's, it's gonna be, the units of the electric field are actually voltage per unit length, which is interesting because we don't normally think of an electric field in terms of those units. Usually we think of the electric field in like coulombs or something like that, but you can see actually it's in voltage per unit length because we have EMF here, voltage per unit length. It's, it's pretty interesting. Okay, now we're gonna talk about eddy currents. This is gonna be important for Thursday because I'm gonna do a demo on Thursday of some really cool stuff involving eddy currents. And, dis and we're also gonna talk about displacement currents too. So in the examples of the induction effects that we've studied, the induced currents have been confined to well-defined paths in conductors and other components forming a circuit. However, many pieces of electrical equipment contain masses of metal moving in magnetic fields or located in changing magnetic fields. In situations like these, we can have induced currents that circulate throughout the volume of the material. Because their flow patterns resemble swirls.